Hey everybody, so today we are going to be talking about how do you version a knowledge graph data model, i.e. an ontology, or honestly this can count for taxonomies and other types of data models, or your knowledge graph. And the reason this is a really common question once you start to get into your knowledge graph journey is if you think about how a graph is constructed, it's a bunch of nodes connected to other nodes. It's creating a network. And so what happens if one of those nodes or one of those connections changes can actually have a ripple effect throughout your entire graph. And because graphs have lots of little mini neighborhoods within their network, um, those could be changing rapidly, some of them, and some of them could be really static. And so then it becomes a matter of, well, do you need to update the entire graph? Do you want to have a subset that gets updated more often? Um, what's the repercussions of things being outdated or having to be updated constantly versus, you know, on a, on a different basis? So there's a lot of questions that you need to get um, answered before you start to figure out what kind of versioning you need. Um, but it is a common question because it's really tricky if you have a lot of changes happening in a very large graph or you have um, a concentrated area of changes that are happening in a graph or you need time series, which is like more transactional, faster paced, um, which again, if you're having a lot of different changes and you have to calculate all of the different um, changes throughout the graph, that could be that could be kind of difficult. So we're going to go over the different types of versioning, some of the considerations, as well as um, the things that you need to watch out for, um, or maybe even the perks as as you go through this and decide which one is best for you. All right. So with that, let's go get started. All right, so I have updated this a little bit. Um, hopefully zooming in a little bit will uh, help you see what I'm doing. Uh, I've also heard um, commentary that, you know, you want more visuals. They're really hard to craft visuals and then inset, inset them into the video itself. So I'm gonna try to do this and see if this uh, works. If you like this style, please leave a comment down below so I know about that. Okay, so we are gonna be working with our pizza ontology and Keep in mind, if you're not working with an ontology, if you're working with a taxonomy or you're using a property graph and there's no ontology, it, it doesn't really matter in this case. Um, just imagine, so an ontology is the schema and then the things you are populating into that schema are your instances and that creates your, your knowledge graph, right? Because those are the instances and how they're all connected together. So um, if you're wondering, that's how you would interpret some of the things that we're gonna go over here. <laughs> Okay, so jumping into the very first one that is the most common, and that is a full refresh. Full refresh is probably one of the easier ones to do because it means that you basically flush the old graph, you sunset it or you deprecate it, and everyone has to update to the new one. Now, if you're working with one graph and you have a very small team or one person, <laughs> oftentimes, updating your graph, maybe there's only one system or just a small set of systems, um, or interfaces, whatever it is that depend on this graph, that can work because um, getting everybody, everybody meaning the one system and you, if you're the person updating it, um, to switch over to the new graph isn't as difficult. However, if you have a lot of systems, a lot of people, a lot of connective uh, stuff that this graph is supporting, a full refresh means you're going to have to put some data governance in place where you have to give your stakeholders, you know, two, three months in advance of the new version going out so they can all start to understand what those changes are, how it's going to affect their systems, do some um, mitigation if it's going to break things because you don't want to update things and have things down down the road break. Um, nobody wants a broken query or you know broken interfaces and whatever else, missing data. Um, so all of that checks and balances, you need to make sure you give prior notice to anyone using your graph because they're the ones who depend on that information. And so you need to give them advance notice if you're doing a full refresh. Honestly, you should do that in general for all of these, um, just as a, a friendly warning to anyone who depends on this data. And if uh, you have a lot of stakeholders and they're all asking like, ah, give us the updates. Um, it's it's kind of like a product feature, right? Like you're, you're announcing, hey, there's a new version of the new product. Um, meanwhile, it's your data product, it's your knowledge graph. So what that would look like is um, in your model or in your snapshot of your graph, you're going to have this kind of provenance data. Now, you don't have to use DC 
terms provenance. Um, this could be something that you have um, in the file storage or uh, the data store that you're using for the entire model. It could be, um, the, like I said, the snapshot that is taken of the whole data set and its schema and all of that. And there's metadata that is associated with that. And so this is where you would have which version it is. Now, with a full refresh, it's kind of funny because the current version is always the most current version. It is version one for all intents and purposes. Um, you're going to have historical data. So you can see here we have different versions and 1 1.5, 1.4, 2, 2.1, 2.0. That is um, historical provenance data. What has changed throughout each version? But the version you're looking at is the only version that exists because the other ones have been deprecated or you can't access them anymore. But it's good to keep track of what has happened so that if you do have to do a rollback because, whoops, we deleted something we shouldn't have or something you know goes awry, you need to make sure that you have a rollback and you also have um, documented the decisions you've made on your graph over time. So even if you are doing just a full refresh, um, it's good to catalog this kind of information. Again, it's kind of a blank statement. You should do that with all of these examples, um, tracking uh, all of those changes, being able to be, do rollbacks, all of that. Um, but you can see here, you have to make a decision if you're going to do full version one, full version two, and that's it, or if you're going to have incremental updates. Incremental updates are usually helpful when you have uh, certain segments of your graph that are getting updated, and maybe you don't need to do a full refresh of everything. So now we're kind of moving into the second type, which is incremental versioning. And it's usually dependent on the um, subdomains within your graph. Like, you know, if you have a graph of, let's say, sports, maybe the baseball area is um, not getting a lot of updates because it's not baseball season, but it's football season. American football season. And so that's going to have a whole lot more updates because there's a lot more going on right now. So then the baseball side doesn't have to get updated. That's maybe on version one, but the football version is version two, the whole graph, you know, because you're still doing a type of version of a full refresh where baseball is getting part of, is part of the full refresh, but nothing really changed with it. So you can have like some of that subversioning happening, in which case you could have in the full refresh, this is version 1.2, because there was enough that changed in those mini graphs or uh, domains or um, certain subsets of your graph that you, um, you updated those but not others. So that's kind of the second version where you have these incremental updates that are going out, but it's still another flavor of a full refresh because you are still like taking the whole graph and, and redoing it. The third type is if you don't do a full refresh and you only refresh that mini section of the graph. So that is not a full refresh. That is an incremental versioning uh, per subgraph. And again, same logic as what we just went over. Um, and so let's see what that would look like. So let's say um, our domain of dough is uh, evolving rapidly because, you know, we, we now in our uh, pizza parlor have a lot more people with allergies, and so we have to have um, a continuous, you know, update of information on our dough and the ingredients in the dough. So um, maybe that's the only part of our our graph that constantly is changing, though, because we're getting, you know, we're trying new things, we're trying to get, you know, um, we're innovating, we're we're doing a lot of new things, and we need to uh, make sure the graph is is up to date with those things. So in that case, you would have this is the um, top level node or the domain of, of this, this, um, this space in your graph. And then over here is where you would add in um, the provenance data. And you can see here, it's just another piece of data and you can query on that. And um, if you wanted to, you could put a date um, associated with that. So you know which in which point of time that happened. If we had others, you know, maybe we have a huge um, manufacturing company for pizzas. And in that case, there might be other distributors, other manufacturers that we work with that are maybe using our graph that need to know when this stuff is happening and they get like that up-to-date information from us. That's where this would be helpful where, you know, if we have, we have distributors and manufacturers, um, for dough, 
they're not going to care if the area of cheese is updating for us, right? Like they're not going to care about that because that's not, that's not their domain, right? Their domain is not cheese. Their domain is dough. So if we are updating dough and we have cheese manufacturers, they wouldn't care if we made this update. So those are some of the um, decision points you might be want to think about when you're going through which type of versioning to do. If you have areas that are constantly changing and um, you don't want it to really affect the rest of the graph, or you have um, people or downstream systems that really depend on updating, knowing when things are updating, but they don't need the whole graph um, to, to really stay on top of those things. Okay, so, so far we've been talking about the whole graph. Um, the next area where um, we're gonna get into is individual node versioning, where maybe you don't need, I mean, all of these can be mixed and matched, by the way. Um, other than just the first one, which is like a full refresh, which is always just full refresh. Um, but now we're getting into like the node sp a specific versioning. And so we want to make sure that we specifically say when thin and crispy base as a node gets updated. Now, a lot of tools will track versioning based on the changes and that's automated. So if I go in and I muck around with this, it's creating a new version. Um, you also want to decide what changes deserve a new version. That's actually really, really important. So if I go in and I change the pref label and this data is not used in an interface anywhere, this is just used um, on the back end and people can query it, as long as this has an ID, the UID for this graph, it it actually uses the pref label as the ID, which I honestly would not recommend. Um, so this should be an ID, like an actual ID of, you know, uh, alphanumerics or something like that. But because this is using the pref label as its UID, you wanna make sure that if this changes, that means every query, it could break, right? So if it's a breaking change, that means you really need to be careful, make sure that you tell people ahead of time, make sure you give them full disclosure on what's happening. They need to do some testing to make sure what's gonna change, what's gonna break, give them time to make updates. Um, that has to happen. But it's also, well, if this is gonna be a breaking change, then you probably need to make this a new version because if people are using the old version, it could break. Or if we're not talking about breaking changes, if you go in and you change a certain percentage of something, so we have one, two, three, four items here. If we change, let's say two or three of them, that's more than half of the, the data associated with this. Or this is the other piece, the mapping behind the scenes, right? Because these are just the nodes, this is the schema level. If you switch thin and crispy base from table one to table two in your backend systems that are populating uh, the graph, you probably want to have a new version because a significant amount of data and even the backend data that is um, being populated into this node uh, is changing. And so that would probably be something you want to have a new version for. And so um, when you're making these versions at the node level, if your graph is making these in an automated way, that's number one. It's, it's a timestamp of change and it will do it for either all changes or what we just walked through, um, significant or breaking changes. So that's the, the uh, other flavor of that one. Another way to do this is Unfortunately, if you have to support multiple versions of a graph, I would really, 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 really try to avoid doing that. Um, a, a better approach to that is um, the second or third one in this list, which is the incremental versioning where there's a specific domain or specific um, neighborhood in your graph that is on a different um, update schedule or versioning schedule, that allows you to make quick changes there. And the folks that depend on that can make sure that that gets updated, whereas it's not really affecting the rest of the graph. But that's where you have to always do a calculation, and this goes for all of these. How much of your graph is being affected by this change? 
because if you can have a specific domain and it doesn't have a lot of overlap with other domains, there's a limited risk that a lot of changes in that one neighborhood of your graph is going to affect a lot of the other um, parts of the graph that aren't being updated. If you can show that, then you can do those incremental updates without having to worry about supporting multiple versions of a graph. If you do have to support multiple versions of a graph, oftentimes there are two versions, almost always. And the, the first version is the live version. It's the real version that everyone is using. It's the production version. And then there's like the working copy. That's always the second version, but it's not really a version because that's where you are, you know, adding in those updates, doing commit changes and things within that, that uh, version before you then promote it to live. And so um, in that case, that's another type of versioning, which is more like a GitHub-like versioning, which honestly you can use Git like um, things in all of this where you have a fork and then you commit and then it goes into the, the main branch and blah, 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 all those good things. Um, you can use that kind of versioning in all of these, honestly. But when you are having the two-step approach where you have live production and then the working copy, that is where um, some of that is, is really helpful, where the changes are happening, they get reviewed, they, you know, the calculations happen, you tell everybody it's going to happen, they get pushed into the upcoming version, and then once, you know, you tell everyone, hey, 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 we're going to go to the next version, make sure all your changes get in, it's the other thing you have to worry about. You don't have to just make sure your stakeholders know you need to make sure that the people editing or um, asking for you to make changes to the graph are aware that there's a new version coming in, get your changes in right now, or they're not gonna get into the next version, whenever that might be. Um, you have to kind of like freeze everything at some point and then you promote into, um, into live. So that's kind of having um, two versions, but um, in different production uh, levels, uh, different stages of development. Uh, but then there's like true, honest to goodness, having um, to support totally different graphs. And that's where um, I think it is helpful to have um, information associated not within the nodes themselves, um, because I mean, you can still do that. Don't get me wrong. But when you have different versions of a graph and people are, are potentially needing parts of the old graph, while they're trying to migrate to the new version that you've you've said is the one that they should all be using, they might have to use some of that legacy information. And that can be at the node level, but it also can be at triple level. Um, or if you're in the property graph, you know, the, the statements being made. All right, so to show what this would look like, and this is going to be sort of like a quad, and um, I'll pop some stuff up on screen here so you can kind of see what the W3C RDF standards look like for this. Um, but in a property graph, it could actually be of another node that adds qualifiers to your uh, triple statement in, in your graph. In RDF, let's just play around with something here. So we're talking about thin and crusty, crust, crusty, <laughs> thin and crispy base. All right, so we have this, this relation happening, which means any thin and crispy base instances, so manufacturers of our thin and crispy bases of our pizzas and the manufacturers of our um, cheese sticks that go onto our pizzas. There's always already that connection. Again, I'm I'm modeling this in a really funky way. So apologies for this is trying to do this um, as an example. These should be under manufacturing, not um, the things that, that they are manufacturing, but that's neither here nor there. Let's go with the, the example here. Um, so what this means is if this is a relation that Bob's Biz specifically is used and Yum Yum Cheese is specifically used together in version one, so version triple, right? So that's our new node. And then we can connect that to any other things that we need to. And then we can just add this as a quad to any of the information that we are trying to spe specify for a triple. Um, or a statement in a property graph, right? When was that an accurate statement? Or when was that a valid statement? Or when was that a statement you could query on? So that 
is maybe for version one and maybe now we have switched manufacturers and that is no longer a valid query, but maybe you have to do historical uh, querying and find out, well, when, how often did they, did we get in, invoices in or shipments in from those two manufacturers and when were they connected together? So that kind of like provenance, making sure you can go back into the historical data and do um, assessment is really important. All right, so I know that was a lot to unpack. Um, if you are interested in a deep dive in any of these uh, types to kind of really uh, stress and dive into um, you know the importance of these, the different um, decision points. I tried to, to cover a lot in this video. I really hope this is helpful. If there's anything specifically that you had questions on, please make sure you leave it down below. And with that, I hope this video has been very helpful to you and uh, yeah, I'll catch you next time.